At this time, please welcome LPI President Linda Darling Hammond for welcoming and introductory remarks. Hello to everyone who is here. Let's go back a slide. Uh, I want to thank Nicole uh, to the beginning. Thank you. I'm here to, today to launch the Whole Child Policy Webinar Series. Um, between now and May 2023, this webinar series will explore the various elements of whole child policy that are featured in the Whole Child Policy Toolkit and share insights from state and district policymakers who've engaged in efforts to shift toward whole child education, building on what we know from the science of learning and development. We would like to thank our whole child policy table funders, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Harmony and Inspire at National University, Pure Edge, and the Wallace Foundation for their support for this webinar series. We'd also like to thank AASA, the School Superintendents Association, and the Sold Alliance for sponsoring today's seminar. Uh, and with that, I'm going to set uh, us up with a little bit of framing remarks. Uh, about the moment that we're in and how that invites us to really lean in on this whole child education work. Can move to the next slide. So we're at this moment in you know a perfect storm uh, of uh, for public schools. We've had a uh, worldwide uh, public health crisis, an economic crisis. Uh, we're having a climate crisis in many, many places. We've had a civil rights crisis and a reckoning that is long overdue associated with the many inequalities in our society and our public school system. And right now, as we are coming back from the pandemic uh, into an endemic phase, we see across the country some other worrisome signs. There's declining enrollment in many places. Some people are opting out of school entirely. Uh, there's chronic absenteeism uh, in, that has been increasing. Uh, we're worried about learning loss. The data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress was just released this week and showed that across the country uh, there were um, fewer students achieving at the same levels uh, as there were in 2019 at the proficiency levels. Uh, we have mental health challenges that have been taking hold uh, across all of our um, young people and, and adults in schools. Uh, and then, of course, we've added the stresses uh, and uh, anxieties associated with mass shootings that continue to recur. Uh, and now 95% of schools are doing mass shooting drills. Uh, talk about creating toxic stress for young people and anxiety. And then we hear the stories about students coming back uh, from the various forms of um, distance and other learning they've been in uh, and sort of acting out. That is the result of trauma, which dysregulates behaviors uh, and needs to be received in ways that can allow students to work through the experiences and feelings that they've had. Next slide. So, you know, where there's a, also a tension in the discourse around this moment. Uh, there are some in the political world and uh, some educators as well who are really anxious about the test score, um, what look like test score losses. Um, there's a, a, a press in some places to try to double down on test-based instruction, try to drill the kids to you know, demonstrate uh, gains in learning. Uh, there is also in some places a return to sort of zero tolerance disciplinary exclusions or a doubling down on that strategy of suspending students if they are at odds with um, teachers or um, engaged in, in the school environment in ways that are uh, challenging. Uh, there's been with the mass uh, shootings, a response to invest in safety, but in ways that harden the school through metal detectors and arming school staff and hiring more police officers or school security, uh, none of which get at the fundamental issues that students are experiencing uh, and may in fact uh, make schools an even more aversive place to be. And we know from a lot of research over many years that these strategies actually end up increasing disaffection, uh, increasing dropouts, and ultimately actually reducing safety and reducing student learning. Uh, so we've got to find ways to really build on what the science tells us about how people 
grow, learn, develop, heal uh, in moments of trauma to create the kinds of schools that will uh, attract and keep students in and allow them to uh, recover from these experiences of the last few years. Next slide. Uh, we ground this work in the principles of the science of learning and development. Uh, there have been a set of articles uh, on the science that have synthesized much of what we know, uh, and we've been working at LPI with our colleagues and many other organizations uh, to figure out the ways in which these should be informing schools and to raise up examples of schools that are using the science in productive ways. We know that the brain is always developing as a product of relationships and experiences. It is not baked and done when we're born. You can't uh, sort of figure out by um, early um, years where a child is on the um, artificial bell curve of unidimensional achievement and say, uh, this student will only progress in these ways and we can put them on a track that is uh, responsive to that. The quality of the relationships that they experience can actually continue to wire the brain uh, and uh, may uh, allow for greater learning uh, for recovery uh, emotionally as well uh, and from trauma. Learning, we know, is social, emotional, and academic, that they're completely connected, that if I'm feeling positively about myself, my capacities, my teacher, the peers in my classroom, I will learn much more. If I have been stigmatized, traumatized, uh, I will learn much less. Uh, and so social and emotional learning is not a distraction from academic learning. It is the pathway to academic learning. The students' perceptions of their own abilities and their level of trust in the environment actually also influ influence their learning. And so it's very important how we engage in school in not labeling, uh, but in affirming and uh, building on assets uh, so that students can see a positive trajectory. And finally, the supportive developmental relationships that we can construct in schools if we design them properly are the most effective antidote to trauma and can do a great deal to undo the um, harmful effects of adverse childhood experiences. So ultimately, uh, we think about how do we build schools uh, which have rich and engaging learning experiences that produce much less cortisol, the stress hormone that clouds our minds, that makes us anxious, that gets in the way of learning, uh, and produces a great deal more oxytocin, which I think of as the hugging hormone, whether it's um, physical or virtual uh, or spiritual, that actually uh, allows the brain to develop more fully and uh, enables learning to be rooted in those trusting positive experiences that allow it to flourish. And with that, I'm going to pass the ball to my colleague, Laura Hernandez. Uh, Laura co-leads the whole child education team at the Learning Policy Institute. And she's been one of the leads for our research on the science of learning and development. Laura, take it away. Thank you, Linda. And it's a true honor to be here with you all today. I'm gonna to pick right up on Linda's discussion of those key sold principles to illustrate what these understandings mean for the way we do school. And specifically, I'll spend time today walking through some recent guidance put forth by the Learning Policy Institute and Turnaround for Children in association with the Sold Alliance that elevates the ways we can design or redesign schools to help youth learn and thrive. And that guidance tells us that schools with sold at their foundation integrate approaches aligned and informed by this framework, the guiding principles for whole child design, which highlights five areas of practice that have been shown to optimize learning and development. And this framework is the centerpiece of the playbook called the Design Principles for Schools, which is an interactive and open access playbook to support leaders and local decision makers in designing or redesigning the schools with sold at their core. And what the playbook seeks to do is make sold concrete and actionable. And it points to aligned practices and structures to elevate the range of approaches that schools can use and adopt in their settings to meet the strengths and struggles of their individual context. And I'm gonna give you a glimpse into each of those elements today. The first is positive developmental relationships or those connections that allow for the development of effective care agency and community in schools. And Sol tells us, as Linda indicated, that trusting relationships catalyze learning. But they also facilitate healthy attachments and a sense of belonging. And they also have that protective effect as they enable adults to more accurately respond to a young person's need and to provide emotional security. 
And there are a number of aligned structures and practices that schools can integrate to build those sorts of connections. A sampling of which you see here in orange, like advisories, which create those small family units in schools that allow young people to regularly connect with an adult and a small group of peers or teacher collaboration structures that allow educators to collectively address students' learning and holistic needs. And of course, relationship building with families like regular conferences and home visits, which can serve as an important exchange to build that web of support around young people to help them learn. Another very much related element of soul practice relates to environments filled with safety and belonging. So soul fundamentally tells us that contexts influence learning. They can communicate messages about who is valued and what sorts of behaviors or ways of being are rewarded or sanctioned. But learning conditions also nurture the way young people can engage in their own academic trajectories. They can open the brain to learning. They can alleviate social identity threats that undermine confidence and performance. And they can even nurture pro-social orientations that support social and emotional development. And structures and practices that create supportive learning environments include those, again, you see in orange. So the ways that practitioners cultivate consistent routines and shared values that reduce stress and support that sense of physical and psychological safety, or the use of restorative practices, which proactively build relationships to prevent wrongdoing and encourage humanistic approaches to conflict resolution. And of course, cultivating culturally responsive classrooms so that young people, particularly marginalized groups, can have their full selves validated and nurtured. I'm going to pause for a moment to give you a glimpse into what these approaches can look like in action with this short video. I'm really invested in what they tell me. The students feeling loved, students feeling nurtured, students feeling like they have a place at school, they're safe. It, it activates their brain cells. Sense of belonging is one of the most important activators of a child's engagement in learning. Everything about activating a child's cognitive skills begins with activating their social connectedness. The energy for learning is coming from the social connection that children have. But in the end, we're trying to come up with an agreement Excellent. We're not going to comment, question. We're only going to encourage. Because they're culturally and linguistically diverse students, I want to really make sure that we are making them feel connections. All the writing we do in our class, it's very much about them. It helps them, promotes them to find their own voice and to share their stories. Sometimes people think every Muslim person is a target or is a terrorist. Thank you, Anissa. What did this show us about what we are good at as a group? Uh, working together, because like we often argue a lot. Today, we did an activity that was really designed to get them thinking about how they're going to support each other. I think that reiterating the idea that we're in this together, um, I think some it, it's hard to find the time, but doing some team building exercises at the beginning of the year and revisiting them can really help illustrate that point. Hey! The aim of showing you this video was really to give you a, a sense of some of the ways that cultivating relationships and that sense of safety and belonging can take form in schools. And you really get a good look and feel of the qualitative character of these. Uh, but the other point that I think this video also underscores is the important role they play in enabling another very important area of soul to line practice, which is knowledge development and the implementation of rich learning experiences. And soul Line schools engage youth in experiences that not only support their academic learning, but also their sense of competency, efficacy, and motivation. So it suggests that practitioners do this by using pedagogy that piques student curiosity and is relevant to their backgrounds and interests, and through learning experiences that enable youth to apply knowledge and skills in meaningful ways. And of course, pedagogy that supports students on their developmental journeys and where they are. SOLD highlights how this type of learning can take form through things like inquiry-driven or project-based learning, which are most impactful when coupled with scaffolds that open up that mental space for higher order thinking. Instructional strategies that build upon students' prior knowledge and cultural practices are also critical as they draw on that familiar to help students build connections to disciplinary knowledge and skills. 
And finally, incorporating feedback loops or opportunities for revision through things like self-assessments or formative assessments is another way to optimize learning as it welcomes errors, not as problems, but as insights into how one can improve their understanding. And given the complex nature of these approaches to teaching and learning, Sold also underscores that, that this sort of learning is best supported when schools are cultivating skills, habits, and mindsets within students. So as Linda noted, Sold tells us that developing a broad set of skills and competencies is not secondary to learning, but rather learning is enhanced as we develop cognitive, social, and emotional capacities simultaneously. And in practice, this means explicitly integrating opportunities for youth to cultivate competencies like those you see here, including self and social awareness or interpersonal and communication skills, or enabling students to persevere in the face of challenges, to manage their own learning, and to build a sense of agency and a growth mindset. And all of these can be explicitly taught, modeled, and discussed in classrooms with dedicated time and curriculum in place, yet they don't need to be standalone opportunities. Practitioners can and should integrate the development of these skills into instruction and throughout the school day so that they're used and applied frequently. And that leads me to a final area of SOLD practice, SOLD, which is the science of learning and development. Thank you for the comment in the chat. Um, and this pertains to integrated student supports. Um, or that coordinated web of supports that allow students to thrive in the type of learning and relationship center context I just described. So these sorts of systems mitigate barriers to learning and help ease the effects of adversity, especially when they're readily available and accessible in ways that don't stigmatize or shame. And they can also enable personalization so that young people are able to get the supports they need when they need it and for as long as they need it. And to do this, sold points to the ways schools can build coherent multi-tiered systems of support to advance learning, which includes universal everyday practices that make the core work of a school supportive. These can in turn surface additional academic, social, and emotional needs, which can be met through supplemental supports like those you see here in orange, and when necessary, more intensive interventions that partnerships or other coordin coordination structures can help facilitate. Now, this brief overview has intended to give you a glimpse into the guidance SOLD provides on how schools can be designed to support learning and well-being, something that has been long needed to address systemic inequities, as well as to meet the acute and compounding challenges Linda mentioned. And the guiding principles of whole child design and the design principles playbook that describes it really puts a spotlight on these areas of practice, taking care to define them, summarize their evidence base, as well as uplift real world examples so that users can see high quality implementation in action. And while Seoul highlights each segment to give them a deeper treatment, it is important to note that schools are most impactful when they integrate approaches across all five areas. Also important to note that Seoul aligned schooling will look different in different contexts as schools are really considering their local needs and assets of their communities. Now, what I've described is in a word ambitious and key questions remain on how these schools can be built and sustained. Because whole child design is not the norm in schools, we know this work will require tremendous effort and even courage to push against the grain. And today we're fortunate enough to be joined by a panel of amazing district leaders who are taking up that challenge and have been working to make sold aligned schools a reality in their settings. We also know that this transformation is only possible through attention to policies and systems, which we'll touch on today, but then we'll also be taking a deep dive into over the next five webinars in this series. So without further ado, I would like to move us toward our panel today. Our amazing panel will be moderated by an educational leader herself, Dr. Jerry House. Dr. House is a former president of the Institute for Student Achievement, where she partnered with schools and districts to do exactly the kind of school design and redesign work that is the focus of this webinar today. And prior to that, she served as a school superintendent in Chapel Hill, North Carolina and Memphis, Tennessee for 15 years work for which she was recognized as an AASA National Superintendent of the Year and Tennessee Superintendent of the Year. So Jerry, please take it away. Thank you, Laura. I am indeed delighted to introduce our panel of distinguished school leaders who are transforming the learning environments in their districts to support whole child education. Unfortunately, Dr. Andre Spencer could not be with us today. Since 2011, Eric Gordon has been CEO of the Cleveland 
Metropolitan School District, where he is responsible for the leadership and daily management of Cleveland's 36,000 students. During his tenure, Mr. Gordon led a citywide coalition to develop Cleveland's plan for transforming schools, which has resulted in dramatic improvement in academic performance over the last decade. Mr. Gordon also serves as a member of the Seoul Alliance National Advisory Committee. As Deputy Chancellor of Teaching and Learning for New York City Schools, Carolyn Quintana is focused on the Chancellor's priority of holistically reimagining how the district's students learn. Ms. Quintana previously served as Senior Director of Social, Emotional, and Academic Development at the Institute for Student Achievement, where she worked on developing practices, resources, and systems to help students thrive. There is a quote, if you can see it, you can be it. There are many in our audience today who would like their districts to make the shift to whole child education, and they are interested in knowing more about how you are bringing the design principles we just heard about to life in your districts. So Carolyn and Eric, I would like each of you to take us on a three minute visual tour of your school district to help us better understand what whole child systems change looks like. I know I'm giving you just three to four minutes and it may seem like I'm asking you the impossible, but just give us a glimpse of what we would see, what we might hear that would be significantly different because of your implementation of a whole child approach. So Carolyn, why don't you begin and then Eric, follow up after Carolyn's comments. Thank you, Jerry, appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you for that introduction. I'm actually really pleased to be here with, um, with uh, Eric talking about how we've thought about uh, the sole design principles in different settings. Um, so I'm, I'm overseeing teaching and learning in New York City where we have over 900,000 students and that means over 1800 schools. So a really large system. Um, and part of what we know across the nation is that our, our reading and math proficiency levels are low. 49% proficiency in reading and 37.9 proficiency in math. And when you dig even deeper, um, for our black males, for example, that reading proficiency drops to 29.2%. And every single time I say that, it hurts my heart. When you think about our English language learners, their proficiency is 12.7%. Um, students who have IEPs, 18.3%, and, and very similar patterns for math as well. And so something that we've been doing in education is not right yet. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't have schools where folks are really trying where folks really care, but we haven't yet thought about holistically what needs to happen in a school and in a school system so that children are taken care of and feel held, supported, um, and, and can engage in ways that they can actually learn. I love that Linda referred to oxytocin as the hugging hormone. What a great way to think about it, right? And so what are the structures and, and the opportunities that we put in place across schools that allow kids to, to release those kinds of hormones so that they can feel ready to do the learning every day? And so um, part of what we're struggling with is how do you create consistency across a large system when you have various design principles and you know that none of these principles acts alone, right? And you can't actually establish a successful school or really for us, the, the conditions for all learners to thrive, adults and kids, when you only have one of those principles in place. And so for us, it's been about figuring out what we're focusing on as a, as a city this year um, and then helping schools and districts because I'm at the central office. And so we're the grownups that work with the grownups that work with the grownups that work with the kids, right? We're those adults that are currently developing the districts who then develop the principals who then develop the teachers who work with the kids, right? And so for us, it's how do we focus on building a strong system of supports and ensuring rich learning experiences. And so citywide, our goals are about improving core instruction, increasing access and mitigating barriers, um, and developing and supporting high quality educators. If we can really spend the time developing our educators so that they are thinking about how they show up as much as they're thinking about their capacity to teach, 
um, then we can ensure that we're creating the right kinds of environments. And with that core instruction piece, it has to be about having high quality curriculum as well as those pedagogical practices that are gonna provide students with the skills needed, um, as well as the environments needed to, to make progress. Um, and I think you know, the increasing access and mitigating barriers piece for us is part of thinking about the, and to our chancellor's um, pillars, reimagining student experiences through deliberate attempts um, to create, a, you think you heard Laura earlier talk about how students feel about themselves as learners, right? That they should feel like they belong, that the work has value for them, that with effort, their competence and confidence can grow. Um, we need them to have the skills and the stamina to be successful. Most importantly, to have adults show them that they believe that they can. And so what are the adults doing to create those environments, right? And what is it that, that we can help develop? So for example, and I'll, and I'll stop it here, I'll just give you a, a quick example. Um, we have a dual language program, and I talked about this actually earlier today in, in another forum, um, dual language, bilingual ESL programs, and we're actually spending a, a great deal of energy this year to expand and revitalize those bilingual education programs, not just for the sake of, of expanding them, um, but because we know that when we do so, we are telling students that their language is a strength. And if we employ those strategies and, and think about um, translanguaging as a way that children can make meaning, because not just because a language is, it, various languages can get used in a space, but because they start to think about what does my language do that this one does or does not? And so how do I make meaning in a classroom in those ways? And so we want them to be reminded of that, but most importantly, we need the adults to see that, right? That it's an asset. Teachers, principals, and peers need to see the language they come in with as an asset. And so thinking about heritage language curricula, thinking about the strategies that all teachers need to have in order to best support English language learners, um, and thinking about how we can actually um, bring that kind of respect to the classroom to engage them better. And that means that we have to support teachers and leaders to be prepared um, and to be able to personalize experiences in that way. So building on um, Carolyn's really great remarks, particularly about high quality curriculum and the pedagogical experiences for us, I've been in Cleveland as, as, as Jerry mentioned, um, since 2007 and as the CEO since 2011. And so when the pandemic hit, it would have been really easy to try to get back to normal. Um, but we really chose to leverage what Linda mentioned at the top of the webinar, the moment we're in. Um, and not just the pandemic moment we're in, but in the social justice crisis moment we're in and, and all of the things that were on that slide. Our community had already been telling us that they saw academic improvements, uh, reading and math scores were up, graduation rates were up, but that they weren't seeing the kinds of experiences that uh, suburban kids were having. And so we had already gone into the pandemic with this notion that we needed to create a, a better experience. We now call it the CMSD experience. Um, but it, it led us to uh, create a learning vision to emerge out of the pandemic with and I'll um, ask that we put it in the chat that we have a whole web presence of uh, content that you can access on it. Um, but I'm just going to unpack it and really encourage you to think about the design principles that Laura talked about, those five principles. So for us, first of all, it is in pursuit of a more fair, just, and good system of education. So this is equity work at its core. Um, and, and really being clear that uh, while we can't solve every inequity, we can be aggressive about having a much more fair, just, and good system of education. And we want each of our learners, and for us, that means both our scholars and their educators, we want everyone to be a learner. Um, and because youth development or the, the development principles, um, as Linda mentioned, don't stop for youth, we continue to use them as we grow. And we want those learners to be individually and collectively engaged because learning is both um, experiences and relationships. And so you need that collective experience in, in your learning. And But schooling tends to be very individualized. So individually and collectively engaged in academically complex tasks. Um, we don't say rigor because if we asked every person on this uh, seminar to put their definition of rigor into the chat, we would have 158 different definitions of rigor. But when we talk about a complex task, people can describe it very tangibly. Um, and, that, and we're pretty good at schools at creating complex tasks, but, but they also have to be worthy of productive struggle. This is where students are actually you know, challenged in that developmental experience and um, those rich relationships and learning experiences. Once they've done that, we also need them to have authentic opportunities to demonstrate what they've learned. And it's not just their academic content, 
um, which is critically important, but it's also those transferable skills. It's those skills, again, that Laura talked about that we'll use um, as we go on to the next project, the next learning out into the world of work. And then finally, it should be fun, a joyful and adventurous environment. School isn't actually supposed to be a place you don't want to be. It's supposed to be a place that brings joy and adventure. So that's the work we're trying to frame in Cleveland. And, and so we're doing this by making four deliberate design um, elements that make this come to life and three shifts in practice. The, the intersecting design elements is first really making a shift to competency-based, personalized, mastery-focused learning, where those tasks actually are outcome-focused and that there's something to produce and demonstrate. We're also really focusing on schools without walls, thinking about how we use time, place, technology, and talent very differently for an anytime, anywhere learning. So we have schools inside of hospitals and museums and, um, and, and things of that nature, but we also are thinking about how do we offer 24 hour, seven day a week tutoring opportunities with the new technologies that are in place and live access to classroom teachers in the evenings so that you can get that extra support and those extra layers is just some examples of that. A big focus on whole human learning, thinking about the social, emotional, cultural, and physical wellness of our young people and their adults. And then finally, it, uh, really working on personalized learner pathways where over the course of a student's development, they take increasing responsibility for voice choice and agency in their learning. To make that happen, we have to have three shifts in practice. So we have to shift the practices of learning, and that's really the kinds of experiences that learners have. Um, that to do the, the sold work requires a very different way of approaching literacy and numeracy curriculum um, than the, the sit and get that, that has gotten us only so far along the way. It's also about cultural, the ways we work together. And this really, again, gets at the relationship building with kids and adults, kids among kids, adults among adults, and kids with adults. And then finally, the tools, how we rethink the use of people, time, technology, and place uh, to do this. And just to give you a very quick glimpse into this, on Friday uh, of this week is Demonstration of Learning Day district-wide. And so that means that our kids and our teachers have had a pe period of time that we call safe practice because we want to incentivize um, the safety of trying these new ways of behaving. Uh, where teachers have been able to implement mastery-based uh, projects in their different fields. And on Friday now, students will be inviting their parents and, and um, you know, people from the community, and they'll be presenting their content, and they'll be responding to questions, and they'll be asked what transferable skills they're using. And so we're seeing this come across and come alive across the district um, and really being something sticky that people are clinging on to. And there's a big bet in here. You know, one of my colleagues in Ohio uh, was measuring NWEA scores last year on recovery while we were doing this bold work. And my NWEA scores didn't look as good as hers. And I was really worried when my state report card was coming out. Our state report cards did come out. And as we know from the NAEP data that Carolyn mentioned, uh, reading and math scores were dramatically impacted. But what we also saw is that Cleveland actually had the highest growth in any urban in Ohio and 12th highest in the state and had the highest gap closing of any urban in Ohio um, and made us rank the top rated urban school district this year in the state of Ohio. And that's from a district that was dead last when I came to Cleveland. Now we have a long way to go. And I can't say um, from a science point of view that it's because of the shift that all of that happened, but I can tell you that we're seeing it become sticky and important and trying to take not just how do you make a school um, that is built and sustained on the sold principles, but how do you take a district of 35,000 kids uh, and do the same thing? So I'm really looking forward to the conversation with Carolyn and Jerry, thank you. Thank you. Thank both, thank both of you and for the remarkable work you're doing in your districts and implementing the design principles. You know, Linda mentioned the challenges that we're that you're facing, that schools are facing, um, the impact of COVID-19 and perhaps another winter surge, which we certainly hope doesn't occur, uh, as well as the, the need to support learning recovery that was so clearly highlighted by the release of the NAEP results this week. And all too often, districts are also grappling with the unimaginable tragedy of school violence, as we saw in St. Louis just this week. Um, how are you approaching 
these challenges through a whole child lens. Um, I know from my experience as a superintendent with many competing demands and needs coming at you, it's sometimes difficult to maintain the fidelity to your strategic focus. So Carolyn, take a few minutes and talk with us about how you are keeping the whole child lens on curriculum, instruction, and assessment while focusing on this urgent need to address learning recovery. Thank you, Jerry. And actually, I'm glad for this question right after Eric just shared, right? Because it's very much about what he was talking about, that when you, you're you focused on just those NWEA scores um, and just looking at it in terms of preparing for an exam, and I think Linda had this in her slides as well, you're not going to get the same results that you do when you're really thinking about how students learn best. Um, the key with that, though, is that it is not, and, and we know this about the, the design principles, right? There isn't a single design principle. There's not a program. There's not a something you can buy. It is about developing a, a system of supports and really thinking about how all of these design principles work together. And it looks a little different in different situations. Um, when I was working at my own school, I, I really, we had lots of conversations around what is a culture that we want to create that is about how students learn best, right? And so we had this vision of a caring, safe, collaborative community. We had the structures and, and built, uh, took a lot of time building trust um, and then made sure that all instruction was grounded in inquiry and that required a great deal of training as well. Did a lot of work around integrating the socio-emotional into the academic, right? And that was in a school setting. It took multiple years for that to happen. And so now in a citywide setting, when we're talking about 1800 schools, it's, it's, I think, really important to think about how you're going to first identify what is it that needs to be in place in order to begin this work and what already exists in a setting in order to do it. And so for us in New York City, um, really thought about uh, developing, going back to basics is what we keep saying, right? And so we are focusing, and I mentioned this as one of our first goals, on improving core instruction. And that's high quality um, with that cognitive challenge, right? I love that you said um, complex tasks, Eric, and, and making sure that complex does not mean just convoluted, right? That is, um, that we're thinking about like sophisticated that require that sort of deeper learning that 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 thinking that sears your brain um, and so for us that means putting in place um, or making sure that our leaders understand what a multi-tiered system of supports looks like what high quality tier one instruction looks like and that they're investing in that first um, and really important for us as we're developing that uh, shared developmental framework to not think of tiers two and three as locations we send kids to or labels that we assign to children or things that kids have to do, but instead really flipping that to be about the adults. And that's one of the things that I think I like most about the design principles is that it goes back to what do we do to create the conditions for learners to thrive? And as, as the central office, what do I do to help people do that? Um, and so removing those obstacles for learning, really helping to address the effects of adversity. Um, and then for us, it's also about like the curricular designs and instructional strategies that we're putting in place. And so really thinking about, you know, we've had to um, reimagine and actually build an entire literacy team. We didn't have one before. Our literacy levels are low and there was not really a literacy team. And so we have one now. But because we know, and I love Eric that you said earlier, this isn't just about the young people, this is about the adults. And so I know my adults will need support. We have coaches, we have intervention specialists now. We didn't have that before. And so they have this entire support system to help them get better at what they're doing. So now they can support kids to personalize that learning, to really think about developing um, that academic capacity, the competence, right? It's about that teacher efficacy that leads then to the, the children's motivation and, and success. And that's what we really need, right? And so that um, scaffolded almost like support for the teachers so that they can in turn do that for the students and a lot of use of data and you know not data again to label the kids but to make decisions about if we're focusing on high quality tier one and a child is having trouble engaging or being able to access it i need to know why and then when i know why i can set aside time and space to support them with really personalized interventions and after a, a period of time to, to make decisions based on my observations in that classroom they are engaging much better now or they're not they're making progress or they're not to reassess them and then make decisions about do they need deeper interventions or not right and so really returning to this isn't a multi-tiered system of supports. We Most of us went through teaching 101 and learned about terms like this and maybe did 
didn't actually ever get to really develop a system in that way or get to think about what does high quality tier one mean or immediately just thought of like tier twos and tier threes when the important part is what happens every day in my general classroom. In what way am I thinking about what I'm putting in front of students, how I'm supporting them, and as a leader, how I'm supporting the teachers to do that. So really developing those high quality educators in that. And so that's part of it. And as, as you start to do that and you think about like what's already in place that I can build off of, when you think about creating these, these um, school systems that are, are designed to support the whole child, it's no longer that daunting because you've, you've built on something and now you can move on to what's next and you sort of chunk it along the way so that you can think about how do I build, how do I create and know that you're, you're never quite there, right? I mean, I, you can, I have an example of my own school. It, it grew leaps and bounds. We got to a really good place in terms of graduation. Um, we had, when I took over, uh, about 40% of the kids were on track for graduation. When I left, we were in the mid eighties. And so that's real progress. But that school needs to continue to evolve. Now that I'm gone, it will continue to evolve based on the kids they have in front of them, the needs that are around us that we experience every day and what we learn and know about how brains, bodies and learning really happens, right? How development happens. And so um, iterative, just continue to reflect and evolve so that we can continue to grow. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Eric, what about addressing the social, emotional, mental needs that we are seeing in schools before we thought the academic needs was what needed to be addressed, but now we're seeing increasingly students with these social, emotional, mental needs. How are you able to address those with a whole child lens and be able to continue to focus from that perspective rather than just isolated solutions to individual problems? Yeah, Jerry, thank you. It's a great question. You know, I, I want to go back actually to 2007 when I came to Cleveland. So um, on my 10th day in the district, we actually had a school shooting in Cleveland in one of our high schools. A young man came into our school. Um, he had been suspended because the principal was looking for interventions and wanted to remove him from the space while she looked. Um, he uh, came back into the school, shot two teachers, shot two students, and then took his life. And we have never stopped talking about that. Um, and I think it's more important now than ever when we're seeing what's going on. And, and I will be very honest, um, we have hardened our schools. At that moment, um, the superintendent at the time said, we will put the metal detectors in place. We will put the hardware in place that the community was clamoring for. But he said something else really important. This isn't a hardware problem, this is a humanware problem. And so it, it started us on a long journey of social emotional learning work in the district, which uh, turned out to be super helpful during the pandemic because we had been training young people and adults in social emotional practices um, for years. Um, and so how does that play out now on the other side? I, I, I know, you know, last year was such a surprise in how much people needed, how kids and adults, and we blamed kids a lot, but the adults were every bit as fragile. And so we really came into this year uh, with a huge focus on rituals, relationships, and routines, and, and really spent, and, and I, I urged my educators for the first two weeks, when I'm walking through your classrooms, I want to see you focused on rituals, relationships, and routines. And we have toolkits that schools can select from so that they can do it in a very personalized way, but that it is about building those relationships first and then shifting those relationships into the presence of content. And, you know, we're not going to be able to do the kinds of things that the sole principles ask of us if we don't think of all of the principles cohesively, like Carolyn said. And a big part of that is that you are not going to access the rigorous pedagogy and the deep curriculum you need if you do not have good social and emotional learning skills. If you cannot figure out how to deal with frustration, self-awareness, or your self-regulation when you are frustrated, if you do not have good social cues to see that, ooh, Carolyn's getting really frustrated, I better not keep pushing her buttons, you're not gonna be able to get into the kinds of engagements that we want. So first is really a, a, a focus at that tier one level on building that capacity. Then we have layered on over time and have had to really ramp them up. What is the next layer of support? And so uh, we have um, invested over the last several years in what are called planning centers, which replaced our in-school suspension so that students can actually refer themselves for help. They don't have to wait to get in trouble. Um, but that if either the teacher or the student or sometimes parents refer, there is a trained professional who has resources to say, okay, what are you struggling with and how can we simulate and slow down and move from your 
part to your head, get your cognitive thinking going about problem solving. Um, and it's again, aligned to our social emotional learning curriculum. We've also invested in social workers in every single one of our buildings. And so we call them family support specialists. Uh, they are there to support students and families. They are connected to our United Ways 211 database. And so they are able to block and tackle a lot of the elements that are getting in the way of kids and families being successful, including connecting to mental health, uh, integrated health work that we're doing, Oh, through this model. And so there's that whole next uh, layer of tier. And then finally, there's a student support team that if, if we just have not found, then we refer to a, a team of people in the school to, to, to try to design a more deliberate response for that young person. So again, uh, the three tiers of approach, and we need those similar things for adults. If I could go back and do, again, my career in Cleveland, I would have started adult SEL work a lot sooner. Um, we're, we're really having to play some catch up there uh, now, but unfortunately, uh, but fortunately, we're seeing. Um, I think because of the excitement of being able to do some some of the things that brought us into the profession in the first place, um, in an urban community where you're typically told to teach to the test scores, um, we're seeing some resiliency in faculty that I think is also um, having positive impact. And the last thing I'll just say is, you know, success breeds success. So when young people start succeeding in these more complex tasks that have relevance, have meaning, are worth productive struggle, that they get to stand in front of peers and their parents and others and be complimented for their work and, and that sort of thing, they're more likely to come back and be ready to do the next project than they are to act out. And so success breeds success in this space. And that's another thing that I think we really need to lean in on a lot more effectively. Sure, and I'd like to put a pin in what both of you said, that use of the design principles is synergistic. It's not a linear, linear approach where you do one this year and one the next year, but they all fit together to create the whole child uh, design. Um, we know that systemic change doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, when I was superintendent in two districts, working diligently to create a whole child vision and a support system, having supportive state level policies and practices was critical. So Eric, you've been superintendent in Cleveland for 11 years. So you've been working, I'm sure, with the state uh, during that uh, tenure. So tell us what, um, policies in Ohio have been especially supportive as you've undertaken the change in your district? Yeah, unfortunately, I have to say that I think the policy environment, and I don't think Ohio is unique in this, but I think the policy environment actually is reinforcing the status quo, reinforcing the industrial model, reinforcing this didactic teach to a very uh, you know, discrete set of indicators um, even as we continue to get feedback that uh, young people need these transferable skills that are not assessed on our state assessments, uh, that they need to be ready for solving complex tasks that are not uh, assessed on our assessments. So unfortunately, Ohio still has a lot of, you know, we measure by seat time, and it's not even hours anymore. It's the number of minutes that young people are in class. So you can get a D minus in algebra uh, and but you sat enough seat time and you get to move on, but you don't easily sit for a test at mastery and get the credit and move on at your own pace, right? Um, even you know when we went through the shutdown in Ohio and we learned how to use some of the remote learning tools, and and let me be really clear, remote learning does not re replace live instruction, um, but there were lessons learned about how to use remote learning really well. Um, but uh, when Ohio gave us permission as a state to start using remote learning options, they also put really rigid requirements about how to account for it um, so that students have to journal exactly what they did in order for the district to receive state money. So really disincentivizing innovative practices through actually policies that reinforce kind of an industrial age and a get back to the status quo age. What we do have in Ohio and what, and what I've levered very um, liberally over my career is opportunities to seek waiver from state policy to do innovative practices. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is that we know that these are the right practices to do. Uh, we also know that they're a lot harder to do. And, and so you have to go the innovative practice route in order uh, to, to leverage that state practice. I would also say, you know, we have a huge amount of federal resources, more than we've ever had before, probably will ever have again in my career at least. 
Um, and yet, um, again, there's an incentive um, because they're one-time dollars with these cliffs not to use them to make these fundamental shifts that sy the systems have to make. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned that actually the policy environment at both the state and federal level are actually disincentivizing us moving to practices we know we need to move to, uh, unless you're willing to take on some of the bold work that Carolyn Stinn in New York were trying to do here in Cleveland and that others that are part of the Sold Alliance are trying to do. So Carolyn, in addition to waivers, what else would you like to see at the state level in New York that would help you uh, in the whole child implementation focus? It's a great question. And I think that I'm actually pretty lucky that right now New York State is being um, incredibly open to new ideas, right? I think that we have existed for so long in, you know, Eric said, the status quo and the policies that maintain that. Um, and I think that they're finally having conversations with us and, and much of it has to do with folks who've really been educators very recently about what's possible. And so we're talking about what would alternative assessments that um, lead to, you know, markers of graduation readiness look like? Um, do those need to be uh, tests or can they be performative? And, and and what would those uh, performance based rather and what would those look like um, and including leaders teachers and other folks in committees to, to do that and so that's part of what we would need right is what does assessment of meeting criteria look like and what are the metrics that we can use and that's actually part of, of what we're struggling with every day is we have so many you know we have accountability a lot of it we have to answer to grants and we have to answer to uh, governments and we have to answer to you know a, a range of different needs and so how do we think about accountability in really different ways how do we help um, create metrics that may be qualitative but that are just as, as valuable and important but that can easily be reported on as well because that's the other piece right is is and especially in a system that is large how do you do that uh, in a way that is systemic and so thinking about those pieces too um, but then also thinking about uh, you know, if we're going to be progressive, how do we create opportunities to practice, to try and to do those things? And so um, the state right now is working with us, for example, on some of those uh, schools without walls. We don't yet have criteria in place for um, for uh, completely online schools, right? And so we're now building two virtual programs within other schools. And so the state is working on um, with us on criteria for that so that the rest of New York can really take advantage of that as well. And so really being partners with them and thinking about what's keeping us from moving forward. Is it because no one's done that yet? Is it because there's a need that needs to be met or that has to be met? And how do we figure out what that is? Um, is there a barrier in the way? And then how do we remove that, right? And so really thinking about those pieces, but I think like with anything else, there are beliefs at the heart of it. And so how do we chip away at those beliefs? And part of that is what Eric was saying, right? Keep showing that I didn't need to do test prep. I actually needed the way that we approach teaching and learning and we had more of an impact, right? And so we just show them the impact of our actions and then chip away at the beliefs that way. And have well, partners, yeah, all, lots of partners. Great. We could go on with so many different inquiries about this, but unfortunately we are at the end of our time. So with your last 30 to 40 seconds, I invite both of you uh, to address this question. From your experience, what is one key takeaway you want participants to understand as they engage in whole child policy and systems change? What's that one critical takeaway you want to have them lead with? The principles of, of the science of learning and development work. So take the toolkit with you, open it up and use the playbook. Carolyn? Yeah, agreed. Um, and I would just add that it it's a process. Um, and so trust the research, trust the experience. There are a whole bunch of examples in that playbook. Um, and and if you if you need support, there are, there are people mentioned in the playbook and there are people on these calls, right, that are willing to support because that's part of what this is. It's it's about creating a community that supports our kids across the nation. Okay, well, thank both of you for such an enriching um, experience uh, with what you are doing in your districts. And uh, now I will turn it over to Jen for closing remarks. Thank you, Jerry. Um, hi, everyone. I am Jen Nepali, a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute. 
I want to first thank Jerry for leading that wonderful conversation. And thank you to Eric and Carolyn for sharing your experiences and insights. I want to also thank Linda Darling Hammond and Laura Hernandez for framing today's discussion and to our co-sponsors, AASA, the Superintendents Association, and the Sold Alliance for being such great partners in this work. As was stated earlier, today's webinar is the first in a series designed to explore the various elements of whole child policy featured in the whole child policy toolkit and share insights from state and district policymakers who have engaged in efforts to shift toward whole child school and system design. Um, in a moment in the chat, you'll find a link to learn more about the webinar series and register for the next webinar which is taking place on Wednesday, December 7th. Uh, and that webinar will be on setting a whole child design. Um, you will also in a moment find a link to a brief survey in the chat that we would appreciate you taking a minute to fill out. Mm -hmm. And I lastly wanna say thank you to everyone who attended today. And we hope to see you at our future webinars.